Now on KGW News at 11, first it was their choice. Now Oregon's governor is ordering schools to get back to in-person learning. With proper measures in place, there's a very low risk of COVID-19 transmission in our schools. Plus, Portland police promise quicker action to respond to vandalism that springs from protests. And Friday night flights returns. Our crews are fanned out around the area to get you the highlights as high school athletes get a chance to return to the football field. This is KGW News at 11. High school football made a comeback in Oregon. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Morgan Romero in for Laurel. We'll have highlights for you when we talk sports. But first, Mike Benner gives us a look at how this season will look so drastically different with COVID protocols in place. Ladies and gentlemen, if the bright lights across the metro area didn't give it away already, High school football is back in Oregon. Gladstone High kicked off its season against Estacada. Senior Ryan Lee will tell you the months long wait because of COVID was even longer for him. I've been waiting for my senior year of football since my third grade year of football. Lee could never have guessed his senior season would look like it does. Face coverings for everybody in the stadium, even the players on the field. Lots of signage to encourage mask wearing and social distancing. Extra benches on the sidelines so players can spread out. Not to mention COVID-19 symptom screening. Lee and his teammates are taking it all in stride. The fact that I'm able to go out there with all of my best lifelong friends and play football is, is really special. Even more special, Lee will get to play in front of loved ones, at least a couple. Juniors and seniors on Gladstone's team will get two tickets to each home game to give to family. But that's it, according to Gladstone Athletic Director Cody Aker. Everyone else watches from outside the stadium. Hopefully the, the communication has gone out and people have received it. Um, and we've also asked for them to be you know, considerate and respectful to, to what we're trying to accomplish. Aker cannot let the number of fans, players, coaches, and game personnel in the stadium exceed 150. But that won't look the same in every county. For instance, fans are prohibited in the high and extreme risk counties. See, safety is the priority for, for the students, for the coaches, for the officials, anybody involved in the event, making sure that they're following the mitigation protocols. Judging by this Ryan Lee interception, he and his teammates won't be letting any mitigation protocols get in their way of making lasting memories. This is more of a special senior year. It really helps me value what I usually took for granted. How profound. In Gladstone, Mike Benner for KGW News. Yeah, kids sure are resilient. Oregon's governor is now ordering all public schools in the state to start in-person learning for any student that wants to go back to the classroom. And she laid out a timeline for it to happen. By March 29th, every district needs to have in-person learning for kindergarten through fifth grade. And by April 19th, sixth through 12th graders need to be back in the classroom. The governor argued the return to class will be safe, that the state prioritized teachers for vaccines for this very reason, put in a statewide rapid testing system for anyone who might get sick, and has $500 million from the federal government to help put safety features in schools. Some parents we talked to today are worried schools will have to adjust too fast. Others say anything less than a full return isn't enough. I am not against schools opening back up. I, you know, and being full in person, I, as long as everything is done safely. Until their children are back in school five days a week, full time, uh, or at least have that option, we're not going to celebrate. If parents want to keep their kids at home, they can keep doing online learning. That's an option. And districts will have the flexibility to go back to online only if the virus flares up in a community. For weeks, we've been showing you how people in larger counties across the Portland metro area have been scheduling or at least trying to schedule their COVID vaccine appointments. But what about smaller counties? Catherine Cook checks in with a couple of them. Counties across Oregon are getting the COVID-19 vaccine to as many eligible people as possible. Their methods are often different than those used in larger metro areas. Well, as small of a county as we are, I think we're actually doing pretty good. Gordon McCraw is incident commander for Tillamook County's COVID-19 response. Rather than asking residents to spend hours online trying to schedule an appointment, Tillamook County is calling residents to schedule appointments by phone. They just have to register to get that call, either online or by phone, when their age group is eligible. 
whenever somebody finds out they're getting the shot, they're actually uh, pretty excited. If I could stress anything, it's, of course, that you need to get on that list so that we know that you're ready for the vaccine. La Crosse says Tillamook County's biggest challenge has been short notice for their weekly vaccine allotment, often learning on Friday how many doses they'll get Monday. That late in the week, it's kind of hard to set up for what you're going to do next week when you're not certain about just how much vaccine you're going to get. According to the Oregon Health Authority, 15.7% of Tillamook County has been vaccinated. In Hood River County, it's 16.6%. It feels good to finally be moving in a positive direction. Trish Elliott is director of the Hood River County Health Department. The county is sharing vaccine allotments with primary caregivers. They can schedule appointments with their local patients as they become available. And that's a win-win because it's a faster distribution than us just trying to do that uh, by ourselves. Hood River County is also offering mass vaccination clinics with appointments also scheduled by phone and email invitation. Their biggest win? Hundreds of willing volunteers. Their biggest challenge? The same as so many other counties. They want more vaccine. Feels like we're just getting little cookies here and there, you know, a vaccine. And so for us, the biggest challenge has been patiently waiting uh, to get enough vaccine to feel like we're really working at our capacity. A reflection of the same goal every county shares to get as many people vaccinated as quick as we can so that, uh, as we say it, life can return to normal. Catherine Cook, KGW News. New tonight, Portland's mayor is calling for an independent review into how a city commissioner got falsely accused of a hit and run. Police say a driver told them Commissioner Joanne Hardesty hit her car and then took off. Then an activist group that's been critical of Hardesty in the past said someone leaked them the police report and they put the information on social media. Of course, it spread fast before police came out yesterday afternoon saying Hardesty was ruled out as a suspect. The mayor today said, quote, what happened to Commissioner Hardesty is wrong and unacceptable. It's a reflection of broader systemic racism and it must be addressed. We need to get to the bottom of it as soon as possible. No one should be subjected to false accusations publicly. Our reporter Maggie Vespa took a deeper look into how the accusations spread so quickly and of course Hardesty's take on it all. You can see her full report now on the KGW YouTube channel. In new tonight, police arrested a man after a three and a half hour standoff in southeast Portland. It happened near 112th and Bush Street. Police had the suspect boxed in in his truck, but he kept trying to escape by ramming police cars. At one point, they sent in an armored vehicle and the suspect's tires were destroyed. He kept spinning his wheels, creating sparks on the pavement. Officers eventually used tear gas to get him to come out of the truck and surrender. He was taken to the hospital as a precaution. Police say they found two guns inside his truck. And gun violence continues to plague Portland. Today, the Portland Police Bureau announced more officers will focus on shootings. Eight officers will be added to the enhanced community safety team. They'll work Fridays and Saturday nights to specifically respond to shootings in the city. In the past two months, police reported more than 170 shooting calls compared to 88 this time last year. And we should note last year was an historically high year for gun violence at this time. Five shootings were reported just last night. In one of them, bullets hit several homes with people inside. This was in northeast Portland near Garfield and Bryant. One bullet missed a person by just inches. We talked to a woman who was in another home where she runs a daycare. I was shocked at first. I was like, are those fireworks? I called my mother and I was like, oh my God, there was just a drive-by or something. And then I went to the front of my house and saw that my door was shot. How scary for her. Thankfully, no one was hurt here, but in another shooting in the St. John's neighborhood last night, a 17-year-old was seriously hurt. Today, Portland police also said they'll add more resources to prevent vandalism, like the damage from a protest last weekend in the Pearl District. There are reports some of the same group will be out again this weekend, though it's not clear where exactly. Police will have a presence in places vandals normally hit and says they'll respond quickly to public disorder calls. 